You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, vet rehabbers. Anae joins me today to speak about overcoming guilt as a vet rehabber. So there are very different types of guilt that we might experience. Anae and I share some of our personal stories with you. I share a story about how in order to avoid feeling guilty, I would never say no and how this nearly led to me being burnt out. It's such an important topic and as you all settle down, hopefully taking a few days off to reboot for next year, I really hope that you all think about yourselves, the boundaries that you've set between you, your clients, maybe staff, friends, family. It's really important that you guys protect yourselves because you're, if you're close to burnout, you cannot treat your patients optimally. I also want to remind all of you that we are here for you. So you can join the Vet Rehabber community Facebook groups. There are um, our Hydro Vet Rehabbers, Equine Vet Rehabbers, Small Animal Vet Rehabbers, and our Business Vet Rehabbers. And within these groups, you also have our mentor programs, which are set up. Um, this is for the whole Vet Rehab community. You guys never have to feel alone. Um, we're here for you. I don't want you ever to feel like you're on your own. Um, there is a whole Vet Rehabber community and we are all very supportive and um, we'll reach out anytime you need somebody to talk to. Before I head over to my chat with Ine, a quick, quick word from our sponsors. Companion Animal Health delivers the most advanced technologies in pain management, photobiomodulation, rehabilitation, diagnostics, and regenerative therapies to veterinarians. Whether your goals are to heal and reduce pain, regenerate and impair tissues, diagnose and record treatment success, or provide rehabilitative modalities, Companion has a solution that is good for veterinary hospitals and their patients. Companion's products are backed by evidence, supported by education, and successfully implemented through Companion's industry-leading commitment to long-term partnership. You can learn more at companionanimal.health.com. Okay, let's chat about guilt and how we can overcome it. Hey, May, thank you so much for joining me with this one. Hi, Megs. Thanks for wanting to chat with me about guilt. I'm excited. <laughs> I know. And we, we say so many times we should record more podcasts together. And then I think the last time we said that was like last year this time. And here we are. Cool. Now we've scheduled a few. Yes, we've scheduled a few. So I'm looking forward to it. It is always nice to record together. So today we're going to be chatting about guilt. Um, and this is something I think we've been chatting about for quite a while. We're saying like, we'd love to sort of sort of dive deep into all the types of guilt that we have as vet rehabbers. Um, and, you know, I can think of a few off the top of my head, but I know that you've done some research because you wrote a blog about it. Um, so I'm going to be interviewing you because you're the expert now about guilt because you wrote the blog and you've done some research. Um, so, yeah, so what, from your research, what type of, guilt do we is there you know like the the different types of guilt do you want to go through that yeah so guilt can it basically falls into into one of two categories um or potentially a third as well so there's normal guilt where you know we do something wrong and we feel guilty about it and we fix it and it's over so there's no problem with that and that's a normal part of how we function and how we work then there's um, a toxic guilt or an unhealthy guilt. And this is when um, this is when it kind of becomes more about I'm not a good person. So we're measuring what we did or we're taking what we did and we're making it our identity. And we're saying, because I made that mistake, I'm a bad therapist. I'm a bad person. I'm a bad mom. I'm not good at this. I'll never be good at this. So you can see that that becomes a very toxic thing. Um, especially if it lasts a long time, which it does. Um, so this kind of guilt generally is going to be present for more than two weeks and it's going to have some long lasting negative impact in your life beyond just the guilt. And then there's this kind of existential guilt where the situation is completely out of our control, but we feel guilty for it. So at the moment, we're experiencing that with COVID. So many of us have had success coming out of the pandemic, 
uh, our practices are flourishing or we've started a new business and it is going amazingly well and it contrasts with people who are not doing well, who have lost their jobs, who have been sick, who have died. So we kind of have this guilty feeling about our success when we think about those who are suffering. And that's very hard to, to kind of come to terms with because we're not in control of their you know, their situation or really our success. So that's, so those are kind of the, the three places our guilt could go. Yeah. And I mean, the pandemic guilt, I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful that all the vet rehabbers are doing well, but it's real. I mean, you do sometimes feel, especially if you speak to somebody, I mean, at online pet health here, we have the same thing. We're online, right? So it wasn't something that majorly affected us, but I, you know, chatting to friends and to family, you know, a lot of them lost their jobs. It's really, really hectic. Um, and sometimes you don't even think about it. You're like, you, you, you don't even realize you actually have that guilt. It's sort of in the back end. Yeah. I mean, if I think about it sometimes now, I don't know, have you ever had that feeling where you feel something, it feels like guilt, but you actually don't know what you go, why are you feeling it? You have no, you can't actually put your finger on it. For sure. Is that, is that, is that, that type of guilt? It can be a part of it and it could be, there could be another, like a, a kind of, how do I say this? So there could be a, like a social pressure aspect to it. So if I think about some of the interviews that you've had, like over the last year and a half, I would say, people will say something like, I don't want to say this out loud, but my practice has never been busier. You know, I, I shouldn't be admitting this, but we've actually never done that this well. And the just the kind of idea that the thought, that thing in our minds that says, I shouldn't acknowledge how successful I am. I shouldn't acknowledge that it's going well because of the situation around me. Um, that's not a healthy place to be. And it's very subconscious, right? It's not something that we're actually aware of. And it's for that reason, we're not necessarily dealing with it or recognizing it for what it is. But um, it's not a, it's not a healthy thing for us to be under the social pressure of just because it's going badly with other people, it should be going badly with me. It's a difficult one to navigate because for sure, we don't want to be flaunting our success in other people's faces, but we can still feel proud of what we've achieved and what we've done. And we can be happy about where we are without, without feeling like without diminishing what someone else is going through, right? When, when you, you have a success and your best friend has a big failure, you can celebrate and cry together. It doesn't have to be a mutually exclusive thing. Um, you can, we walk life together. And so even not in the pandemic, there's always this balance of one person has a success, another has a failure. How do we live life together? How do we go on this journey together, celebrating and crying together? Always a balance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So chatting about those um, unhealthy guilt, right? Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking like, like one of them would be like not being able to treat all our patients. So, I mean, for me, when I was in practice, that was a huge thing. So I'm one of those people, not now, I used to be one of those people who could never say no. I'm so much better at saying no now. Um, it's taken me a long time, but I used to say yes to anything and everything because I didn't want to disappoint that person. I didn't, yeah, like I didn't want them to feel rejected. And, you know, especially with us, with our patients, like, you know, he has an owner who is desperate to get their, their uh, beloved pet treated and help. Um, they're, they're, maybe their dog is in pain or their horse is in pain and they need you. And then, you know, you're fully booked and the phone call comes through and then your receptionist or your practice manager, or whatever says, can you see them? And then you're in that position where you're like, you know, you really can't, but if you don't, what's going to happen to that patient um, or to that, to that pet? And, um, you know, for me, especially, I remember in the early days, there weren't many vet rehabbers around. So there wasn't anybody else. I couldn't refer them to anyone else, which would be a whole lot easier if you could say, hey, I'm fully booked, but you could try so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and I remember just saying, yes, yeah, I will squeeze them in. I will make a plan. And um, in my very last year before I went on my um, sabbatical, I can recall like seeing once three patients at once. I'm not joking. 
So in my lunch hour, I had three patients in separate rooms and I was running between the three of them with other owners or um, assistants holding them, trying to treat three different patients at once. And that was in my lunch break, which was like a half an hour break. I remember just cheating from the minute I got there to the minute that I left, flat out. So, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had that that sort of feeling where you, you want to say no, but you just can't. Yeah. So um, I think that like all of us can really relate to that story, Meg, because we it's our nature. Um, I read in while I was doing my research for this, um, I read in the Telegraph that people who ex- who expect to feel guilty tend to be more sympathetic, to put themselves into other people's shoes and to think about the consequences of the be- their behavior before acting and to treasure their morals. And really what, what that kind of highlights to me is that is our nature as vet rehabbers. We are very compassionate. We are very sympathetic and we're very empathetic with our patients. So we understanding what they're going through it's really hard for us to turn away from that right so in that kind of scenario that you were in knowing that they weren't going to receive help from anywhere else how do you say no to that how do you not help an IVD dog who can't walk right so it's it's a very difficult one the one that I like that kind of toxic or unhealthy guilt that I've experienced myself the most profoundly um, when guilt became real to me, when it became something to me that I, that was a problem, um, was when I became a mom. <laughs> so mommy guilt has been my biggest kind of guilt to, to overcome. But understanding that we feel guilty because we are empathetic, because we want to do the best for the patient in front of us, that makes guilt not a bad thing, right? But also understanding that its effects, for example, in the situation that you just described, none of those three patients that you saw were getting the best of you. So was it actually fair to to do that? Was that the right thing to do for those patients? And kind of having a a bit of a triage scenario in your mind might help and saying like how much of an emergency is this if this is life-threatening if it is you know a true emergency then yes let's deal with it because how could we not deal with that but if it is not then there's another plan that can be made and being so having that in your mind as an option and then having kind of having other plans available so um you didn't have anyone to refer to make but we do in this day and age have so many people to refer to so have a referral network that you can access at your fingertips if that's if that's something that you struggle with then refer out that's necessary mm-hmm. or have have an evening that you can open up if you need to. So a Thursday night, if you need to put in a few extra patients, open up that night um, so that you don't end up working excessive, like adding too many patients into too short a space of time. And you can still give them your best because if we're not giving them our best, then was it worth it then, right? Um, Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think, and I completely agree with you. I was... in that situ- those situations, I was never giving them my best, but at least I was giving them something and not nothing. And I remember for the owners, they didn't mind like that I was, because I used to say like, listen, I can see a, see your, your dog or cat, but this is the situation, you know, and they were fine with it, you know. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I think there's, there's a few sort of aspects to that not saying no especially if you're a pleaser or like a person who's a helper, which I think a lot of us are, we, that's our personality. We help us, we're pleasers. That's why we we're in this job, you know, and um, it's hard to say no to the owner. There's the, the, the patient's aspect, but there's also the owner because, Mm -hmm. you know, the things that they say and you hear the exasperation in their voice when you say no and they're like, well, what am I going to do? You know? And, sometimes just not having to deal with that for me was just easier even knowing that I wasn't giving my best it was something and the the owner was at least a little bit happier far from ideal yeah completely far from ideal so Um, I've definitely had the opposite experience in those kind of scenarios where if I have done something like that, um, I've had it backfire and the owner was not happy and there was a complaint. And um, so my in my experience was kind of the opposite. There wasn't a gratitude for the extra time I put away. They just 
didn't appreciate it, something was wrong. Um, so it backfired for me. <laughs> you know, I think that's about managing expectations, right? So I mean, I used to completely manage the expectations around that. Um, yeah, but it's difficult. And I, and, I, and I think one of the other things is, I mean, if I think in those situations, you know, what we need to do is to set boundaries. We need to say, this is what I'm prepared to do. And, and then also we, we need those boundaries to be our, our team to be aware of those boundaries too, because, you know, often I used to feel a lot of guilt even through my team, because then they would come and say, oh, can you just squeeze this one in? And then saying no to them made me feel guilty because it made me feel like they think I don't care. Um, my team thinks that, you know, I don't want to see this patient because it's more, it's easier for me not to. And I used to have all these feelings around that. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to let my team down because I wanted to be that who I am, you know, that I help and I want to treat every single patient and help, you know, every patient that I can. And I, I remember, you know, eventually getting to a stage where I actually got to burnout. And this is one of the problems with not saying, being able to say no, you think you're doing the best thing. But in the end, you get to a situation where you're, you're nearly burnt out. I was very lucky in that I'd experienced something quite similar um, when I was a vet. And so I very quickly realized the path that I was on and I had to make some changes very quickly. Um, but I wanted to tell you, share the story about when I was a vet and, um, you know, I worked in a two-man practice here in Cape Town, and it was a very busy practice. And the vet that I used to work for went through a few health issues, so some shoulder problems and migraines and things. He was in and out of hospital, and we didn't have many locums. So I had a locum every now and again to help me, but I had a lot of my shoulders, and I was working very long hours, and I was having to do his Saturdays. Thank goodness no after hours. But I was working long hours and, and in vet, this veterinary practice, it was the kind of thing you get there at like copper seven in the morning and you did not have time to have lunch. You literally consulted, operated. And as you finished the, like the last stitch, there was a room full of clients waiting for the afternoon consult and you started consulting again. So it was pretty hectic. And I've always been the kind of person like, you know, I would stay at work till whatever time. And, um, always what happens in veterinary practice. Um, and I must say, I didn't really experience it that much in vet rehab practice, but in veterinary practice, like if you close at six, at three minutes to six, a client will phone and say, my dog has got an itchy skin or something like that. And it's been like this for a few days, but now he is like chewing himself raw and he needs to come down. And, you know, <clears throat> everyone will be like, oh, okay, like, because the poor dog was chewing itself so you got to see it you know um but then you got to wait and so and I remember like every time that happened especially if I had something planned it wasn't ideal but it was fun because I just knew that whatever it was that that animal needed to be seen to and in order for it to have a good night and be able to rest that night and I remember this one day where an owner phoned and I, and I can't remember what it was I think it was there was something in the dog's ear or the dog was like scratching and going frantic with its ear and I remember um the receptionist telling me and I think it was actually Mish um so some of you guys don't know that Mish of the online pet health team actually used to work um as like a, a vet nurse a receptionist at this practice that I used to work at so it could have even been Mish and said the, there's this dog this is what's happening and I remember my feeling um, normally I'd just be like, oh, okay, like we got to wait, you know, and my feeling was one of irritation and it was not of empathy, which I normally had. And I just thought, I don't care, like if this dog, I want to go home right now. And I remember, you know, waiting and seeing the dog and then afterwards, really like re-looking at my thoughts and, and, and thinking to myself, that was so strange that I felt that and I got really a big fright. Um, and I thought, what is wrong with me? Like I was not empathetic whatsoever. And I didn't really care whether this patient had a, was, was struggling with this ear pain or not. Um, and that was my beginning of my path to burnout as a vet. And that was the first sign where you suddenly start to not really care that much. You lack empathy. And I started to pick this up in my vet rehab practice where I was just like, I can't anymore. I, 
like I can't see that patient and the owner would say it's screaming with pain and then I knew but every time that happens when I start to lack that empathy luckily it hadn't gone as far as when I was a vet um but yeah these are the signs of burnout where you actually have to start realizing and I remember just being very teary and just feeling exhausted and um so by, by saying um, yes all the time, this is where the path can, can go. And then we get a serious situation where you get burnout and compassion fatigue, which can take a long time um, to come right. So I don't know if you've got any experiences like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it can. there are people who say it can take more than a year to recover from a, from a proper burnout. So it just, knowing what we know now about taking care of ourselves, setting boundaries, we don't have to go there. We don't need to get to that point. And so it's really important, um, like you say, Meg, to be to recognize the kind of signs, the red flags that come up in our thinking, in our how we feel, in our energy levels, in our focus. There are so many flags that can tell us things are starting to spiral because it is a spiral. It just, it starts with something small and it just goes downhill. And unless we address it, we end up at the bottom of that hill and and it becomes more difficult to address the closer we are to the end the closer we are to break down or to burn out it becomes harder and harder to address whereas if we stop and reassess and adjust our course at the beginning when we see those first signs we have a much better chance of being successful without actually changing too much of our situation right in that scenario you were in originally at the vet practice if you had taken a little bit of leave um, or you had said I need to adjust my working hours and done that it would have most likely been enough but if you continue to a full burnout you would have needed to change careers, right? Because you wouldn't have been able to come back to seeing patients without having those thoughts and without going back to burnout quite quickly. So it's quite, it's something we need to be aware of and we need to take care of ourselves. It's just, it's not worth it not to. <laughs> and guilt can take us down that same spiral. So guilt is one of the things that can that can take us there. And you you said two things um in the beginning, Meg, that that I want would like to touch on. And the first is that other people made you feel guilty. So when a client called or your staff said something, you would feel guilty. I had that with my mom. My mom would make me feel guilty. But doing this research we need to recognize that no one can make us feel anything, right? We take on that emotion and it is an emotion. So no one else is making you feel guilty. Even if that is their subconscious goal, you get to choose what you feel. And that's really important. And the second thing that you said is that it's an emotion. And this is also important because we, we don't say I'm angry right now, therefore I'm an angry person. And that defines who I am. No, I'm angry or upset or sad or happy in this moment. It's an emotion I can experience and process and then move on from, right? It doesn't define who I am. And so we need to look at guilt in the same way. Guilt is an emotion. And just like anger, for example, or apathy, as you mentioned, or irritation, if we feel that, it can be a check for us. It can be something that says, whoa, <laughs> something's not quite going the way that it should. What happened? What did I do? What was my role in this? What, do, what needs to change? And so in that way, again, guilt can be helpful if we use it in that way, if we use it as a check to say, reassess what's happening right now. I feel guilty because I didn't see that patient. Why do I feel guilty that I didn't see that patient? Is it because of the patient, right? If that's dog with an itchy ear if I couldn't see him what would happen he would be itchy tomorrow or the itch would go away and it would be better but he would still be okay right we could I could see him tomorrow and he'd be okay so what is the what leads to us feeling that way 
and how can we change it and what can we learn from it and that's important we need to see it as an emotion so it's not good or bad it is a normal response of our bodies of our minds to a situation and if we see it like that we can be objective and say why am I feeling this what do I need to do what do I need to change do I need to make amends because that's often why we feel guilty because we've hurt someone or we've done someone an injustice so do I need to make amends how can I best do that you do that and then you learn from it and go forward from there. Yeah, you're so right. I think that those are great tips. Um, let's go through some other guilt things that we could as vet rehab. So one of the ones that I can think of is when we have that guilt around a patient, you know, maybe the patient hasn't healed the way we wanted to or recovered the way we want. And if I think about the times when I've really felt that, it's when somebody questions what I was doing. So maybe another vet rehabber or maybe a, a vet um, says, you know, something about what you did or like, I wouldn't have done that or I wish you hadn't have done that or something like that, you know, in your treatments, not, um, not trying to belittle you on purpose, but just in the conversation, like I'm a bit worried about that or anything, any sort of mention about your treatments. And I remember in the early days, really like sick and judging myself then, and then feeling guilty that I'd done wrong by the patients. And, and, you know, this is where that like self-doubt then starts to creep in and you feel like maybe there's somebody better that should be treating this patient and not me. And yeah, just feeling guilty that I haven't done run right by the patients. And that was something in the very early days that I used to really, really have. And then as I gained more experience, I didn't have that because mm -hmm. I would just like, I, I would have that position where like, I, I know what I'm doing and I made those decisions. Maybe uh, things that, they, maybe I could have done something different, but I went through all my choices and I backed them up. And I made a decision and I'm sticking by it. If I need to retract or, or change my path, I will. Um, but I'm not going to regret anything that I've done. Like, you know, so you're able to handle those kind of situations a little bit better. And then you're not as sort of doubtful of yourself, you know. Um, but in the early days, I definitely felt that. And, you know, I think that that reminds me quite a lot of the imposter syndrome that like Katie Ford chatted about in episode 108. Um, that was a really great podcast, guys. If, if you have those feelings where you feel like, you know, you're not, you're not actually as qualified as you think you are, or, you know, you, you, you shouldn't be doing this because you have done all the qualifications, but you don't have all the knowledge and you have these sort of self-doubt feelings, please go and have a listen to that episode um, 108. Any personal experiences around that, you know? Sure. You've like opened up so many things there if you want me to share a personal experience um where guilt has been really a big thing for me to try and overcome it I would say that the the biggest thing where I'm still struggling where I'm still trying to find kind of the path forward if I can say it like that is with regards to my mom because um so for those, those of you that don't know um my mom had cancer and she passed away a few years ago from that but many of you are familiar with the disease. It is not fun. It is painful. There are so many things going on all at the same time, making it like just a mess from every perspective. So what I struggle with still is that I'm a, I'm a animal physiotherapist. Okay. That's what I am, but I still had tools in my toolbox to help my mom address pain, for example. So I don't treat people and I, I feel very strongly about that because I actually don't like treating people. Um, and because I feel that way, I didn't help my mom when I could have. So now knowing that I didn't help my mom when I could have, I didn't like it when I did. Maybe I, you know, used some kinesio tape or something um, to help relieve some of her um, swelling or pain. I didn't like it when I did that because I felt it went against what I believe it went against my morals and then also knowing that there are some of our modalities where the research is now showing that we can make a difference in cancer like laser but I don't have enough information I don't know enough to be able to use my laser to say 
I know that I am going to make this tumor smaller. I just didn't know enough to be able to do that. So I'm still sitting with that feeling that I didn't do enough to help my mom when I could have. Now it's very personal, very close to home, but what's happened because I feel that way is that it has made me doubt what I can do as a vet physio. And it's unreasonable, it's completely unreasonable because it's not within my scope of practice. It's a person and it's cancer. <laughs> so it's not at all what I should, you know, what I'm trained to do, what I'm familiar with. It's not at all what, I, what my, you know, frame of reference should be around, but I feel guilty about it. And so now when I have a patient, they're not improving as they should, I always have that feeling, am I doing everything I could be doing? Am I doing enough? Do I know enough about this modality to be using it as effectively as it should be using. And the more I recognize that these things are coming from that experience, the more I realize that there's a lot, it's definitely guilt. There's a lot of guilt that I haven't dealt with. There's a lot of blame I've placed on myself for that journey that I didn't recognize at the time. And so this is the thing that guilt does to us is when we leave it and we don't deal with it. And when it's unreasonable, illogical and irrational, then the results are illogical and unrational. It takes us down a spiral where our confidence is affected, our clinical reasoning is affected, we no longer feel like we can make those decisions, we doubt our decisions, we second guess everything we're doing until we stop making decisions. So it's much, it becomes much easier for me to say, this is a cruciate ligament, I am going to do X, Y, Z and follow a protocol because I know that that's safe, right? And it's not, that's not going to impact on my clinical skills and ability. It's safe. It's the safe route. But is it what the dog needs? No, <laughs> it's a cruciate ligament. Yes, but there's also a whole, you know, the whole body is affected. So what does that dog need? from me in this moment is not a protocol. So that's really what, what I want to highlight from my story is that when we don't address it, whatever the cause may be, it could have been a patient for you that went sideways. It happens, all right? We need to recognize what was our role in that scenario? What part did we truly play? And what is our, what was our responsibility? Because unless we put on our objective lenses and say, this is what I could have done, this is what I did, then we can't really move forward from that. We can't really move into a healthy place where we can grow as people, right? Or as therapists, because we will continue to doubt that we can use our laser effectively. For anything now, now it's not even about cancer anymore. Now it's about arthritis and you know, all the other things. So it, 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 go, it becomes irrational and illogical. And that's important for us to realize and to recognize in ourselves. Firstly, I want to say thank you. It's very brave of you to share that um, personal experience. And I can imagine how hard it must be for you and must have been for you. If I think about myself as a vet, I think that I find it even hard to treat my own dogs. So I think when some uh, an animal is close to you or a person is close to you, it's very hard to make any like rational decisions because you're you you question yourself whether you know is something that you're doing going to be detrimental, and then you won't you know be able to forgive yourself. I don't think you should be hard on yourself, you know that you didn't help your mom. It wasn't your place first of all to help her in that way. My, I, I have to have a vet to to help me with my animals because I I, I don't have ra I don't make rational choices around treating them. It's the same reason often why doctors often have somebody that sees they don't treat their own family right because you need somebody rational. So being your mom and being in the situation that you were so. I don't know if it helps, but talking about um, the feelings that you have and, and then lacking of confidence, um, as you were saying that, I was thinking about, you know, what can often happen. And I think this happened to me when I was in practice. Um, it'll be a, sometimes around a specific type of case. So let's say uh, you had a medial shoulder instability and then something happened 
with that case or something went wrong. Um, let's say, for example, there was a surgical, something surgical and something that you feel like you did caused failure for the operation or whatever it may be, or the vet maybe feels that maybe you were too aggressive with your rehab or whatever. And that gives you some doubt now thinking, well, was I, should I have done that? And then what often happens is then when another one of those cases come, come in, then those feelings crop up and you think like, mm -hmm. can I actually treat this patient? Am I going to make the same mistakes? And then you become more reserved and you, you know, you said something which so so true like you start playing it safe and and I think that in our field we don't want to be in that place where we're just playing it safe we're, we're in such a new and growing field we want to be able to step out and and to treat and because when we're doing that and and when we're not playing it safe when we're we're looking at everything and we're making decisions based on what we see and, and how we want to treat it not by protocols and not being so reserved that's when we when we have all the findings right it'll be like wow this actually really worked and then you share it with your community and it becomes a thing right and um, so like you might for example not think about trying something that the human people use like a rock pod and then suddenly you think well I'm just going to try it on an animal if you're playing it safe you're not going to you're going to be too scared you can think what happens if it damages the skin what happens if it does this if, and then you try it and you're like wow this worked and you share it with the community and everyone starts using rock pods you know that kind of thing yeah there's so many things like processing that guilt um, so that you don't go into that safe place because when you're in that safe place, I think that you, you're not going to be practicing optimally um, because you're going to be so reserved all the time. And you're not going to, sometimes we have to push our limits a little bit with some of our, our, our patients. Sure. So I think processing guilt is going to be kind of the important part of what you just, like what, where we should go now with this conversation, because recognizing that feeling would be the first step, but then what do I do? And additionally, if it's become a toxic guilt, if it's become a, a, an unhealthy scenario, how do you reverse it? How do you walk away from it? Um, so I just, so firstly, what's important to realize is that we must allow ourselves to make mistakes. Um, and you said that now as well, it, as you were talking, you made a mistake with one patient or with one case. And it is okay for us to make mistakes. We have to realize that it is okay for us to sometimes do something wrong. Um, it's normal, it's how we learn, it's how we grow, we are human. So making a mistake doesn't, doesn't label you as a bad therapist, it makes you a human being. It's what you do with that that is important at the end of the day. So we can either take that mistake and decide that we're a bad therapist and that we're, you know, this is not for us and it's terrible. And if that's where you want to go, then, then you're setting yourself up for failure in whatever you do going forward, because there's nothing you're going to try your hand at that you will not fail at first, like first time, second time, third time, there will always be failures. And every time you try a new modality, you try a new technique, you see a new kind of case or patient or, you know, through your practice, you will make a mistake. So allow yourself the grace to do that and be kind to yourself when it happens, because it's not, it doesn't make you a bad therapist. It just makes you a human being. And it's a great opportunity to learn. So always think of it that way. Then recognize your guilt as an emotion. It is just an emotional response, just like every other emotional response you have. You don't have to be ruled by your emotions. You don't have to wake up in the morning grumpy and continue your day grumpy. You can decide to take that grumpiness and change it and do something else with it. If you can recognize the source and do something about that and then change your mindset. So don't allow your guilt to form a mindset right to change your mindset about yourself and your ability that's really important establish mindset tools that are going to allow you to recognize when something like this comes across your path and how you can deal with it to come out the other side better and healthier then once you've recognized your guilt you need to and you've recognized that you've made an, a mistake accept that you've made a mistake accept it it's okay it's done 
okay, then what is your accountability in that? What is your part in that? So be realistic about really what was your role in what went wrong here. So is it that you used the wrong parameters on a tool and the dog is in more pain? Okay, fair enough. Why did you use the wrong parameters? What led to that decision? Is it because you didn't have all the information? Did you not have a full clinical history? Okay, then you need to change how you take a clinical history so that you don't make that mistake again. Is it because you didn't know enough about the parameters of the tool you're using? There's your mistake then. There's your gap then. Let me say it like that. You need to learn more about that modality. Is it because you didn't actually understand the surgical procedure that, that happened and you didn't know what the proper post-op care was? then you need to address that gap in your knowledge. So looking at it from that perspective, you can identify what exactly was your role. Did the owner withhold information from you? Okay, then it wasn't your fault. Actually, it wasn't your mistake, right? It's still your responsibility and you need to be accountable for it, but there's a shift there in, in why it happened. So you can take that off of yourself. So be realistic in the role that, you know, in the part that you played in the scenario. There's also, you know, is there also a referring veterinarian? Is there also a trainer? Is there also a saddle fitter? Who are the other people that are, that are involved with this patient? And it's not about shifting blame. It's not about saying this was your fault and this was your fault. I'm trying to highlight that you need to be realistic about the role that you played. And if you take on all the responsibility and all the blame, that's not helpful to you to do better in the future. If you can recognize that I did everything within my power, I don't think the mistake was with me. What if it was with the referring surgeon? Okay, I'm saying terrible things right now. What if it was with the referring surgeon? Well, they're also human, <laughs> so that's okay. So I'm not gonna like place the blame there and say that surgeon did a terrible job because it's not what it's about. But potentially I need to have a conversation and say, did something happen here that I don't know about? Try and find where the fault was. Where did it go wrong? Once you know what that role is that you played, as you, you individually played, you can forgive yourself. That's always important. But then you can also ask for forgiveness and make amends for what you did. Own up to what you did. Own up to your responsibility in it. Make amends for it. And that will immediately take the guilt away because then you fix the problem or although at this point you shouldn't be feeling guilty anymore because you're all you're already looking at this logically and from a much better mindset and perspective and then practice compassion so compassion for yourself and compassion for other people so again recognizing that everyone in the team has a role to play but it's not about putting blame somewhere. It's about working together as a team. It's about becoming better and stronger as a team. So how can you be, how can you be compassionate towards yourself and towards other people? And a part of that is practicing self-care. Because if you are overworking yourself and you're seeing too many patients and you made a mistake because you were tired, then you need to take a break. You need to set better boundaries then the lesson to be learned is that you're not coping with your workload right now. You're not coping with the balance between home and patients and your personal goals. You're not coping with that. So if that's the message you need to take, what do you need to change in your life to make that adjustment so that it's going to work better? So really, it comes down to taking care of yourself. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. <laughs> How, was that helpful, Meg? Did that make sense? Very yeah. helpful. Very <laughs> healthy. And, and I think, you know, the acknowledging the part that you played in it and really just working out where, where it went wrong. Like, and it doesn't matter what it is because if you can do that, then you can solve it. You can mm -hmm. solve that problem and it won't happen again. Um, and then I think sometimes the guilt it eases when you know that it's not going to happen again, you know, you're just taking control of that situation, taking control of that emotion and working out exactly why it happened and how you can prevent it from happening again in those type of situations. But the other thing that I really want to just um, elaborate on is the boundaries, is setting boundaries, setting boundaries with your team, with your patients, with yourself, 
saying, this is what I'm prepared to do and looking at that self-care um, and making sure you make time for yourself and that you're, you are only human and you're capable of only doing what you can do and you are going to make mistakes and it's okay. It's all right to make a mistake. We all make them. And it's what you do when you, when you make that mistake that you don't make it again. You learn from it and change things and don't let that guilt eat you up so that it turns you into a vet rehabber who will just do things that are safe. Um, the other thing that's important that I that I have that we haven't spoken about yet is um, we we I feel like there's this perception that we have that if I don't feel guilty about something, then I will become a bad person, right? So if I make a mistake and I don't feel bad that I make a mistake, I fix it, I correct it, I move forward, but I'm not feeling guilty about it, okay? Which I do with lots of things. I can be a little bit callous. Let's <laughs> call it that. Okay, so um, if we if we are in that space, there's often this, this perception that if I don't feel guilty, will I become a bad person? Because then what is my moral compass? What, what is that? But it's actually not true. Guilt does not motivate us to become better people. Guilt sends us on a downward spiral. Guilt lowers the bar of what we expect from ourselves. So when we feel guilty about things, we and we take that on in an unhealthy way, and we make it a part of our identity, essentially, we then identify ourselves at a lower standard. We say, I'm not a good vet rehab therapist. I'm not a good mother. How many of you have thought that? I'm a terrible mom. <laughs> so <Everyone>. often. <laughs> Everyone, it's a normal thing to think that sometimes, okay? But making a mistake does not make you a terrible mom. It just makes you a human being trying to figure out life. So guilt, it lowers our expectation of ourselves. And every time you make a mistake, your expectation of yourself will be lowered. So then guilt, like guilt actually makes you a worse person because now you're less inclined to drive yourself to do better you're less inclined to learn more because you don't feel motivated so guilt actually steals your motivation to do better and be better and it makes you expect less from yourself so it's really not helpful from that perspective if you want to be a better person you need to be motiv motivated by something else right your moral compass is not determined by how guilty you feel or don't feel when you make a mistake you becoming a better person, a better therapist will be driven by how you feel about yourself, whether on this side of the scale or on that side of the scale, the more confident you are in your ability, the more you love who you are, the more you love what you're doing, the more you believe in yourself, the more driven you will be to learn and to grow and to do better and to take your mistakes in stride and improve from them and that's what it comes down to so really um, I wanted to address that because it, it's been coming up a lot in the reading that I've been doing if I don't feel guilty then won't I become a worse person no the opposite <laughs> actually <laughs> actually the opposite so I think that's that was also an important one to say have you ex experienced that ever Meg yeah no no definitely and, and I think that you're exactly right that's how I feel um, is if I if I don't so if I handle the situation and I don't feel guilty then I do sort of feel bad for not feeling guilty and then I, I start to think well is there something wrong with me like why don't I feel guilty about that um, so I've definitely had that you've just justified so if I'm ever callous you've just justified that it's actually okay for me to be like that <laughs> totally okay it, it's totally okay it depends on it depends on the other things that that stand behind it right you don't have to feel guilty about something to prove that you care <laughs> guilt doesn't yeah. mean you exactly. care more you you care more if you care right that's yeah. what quantifies caring if you care so um yeah that was an interesting thing to read about yes <laughs> So I really hope that we have is that everything we've been talking about now just will help you guys to eliminate guilt from your vet rehab practice as much as possible. But if you feel guilty, it's okay. Just got to process it and go through all the tips and advice that Anna shared. And I thanks so much. That has been a really interesting chat. 
Um, and I've got quite a bit to process. So like there are lots of things going on in my head now. And I'll be more aware now of when I have that feeling exactly what I should be doing. So not just sort of squashing it and let it sort of sit there in your tummy, you know, that horrible kind of feeling where you're, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do all the tips and, and advice that you've shared. Awesome. Thank you, Meg. This has been, it's been really interesting learning about this and really kind of starting to understand guilt through becoming a mom has opened my eyes to the effect that it can have in our lives. And I want to just say as kind of a parting thought to anyone who struggles with guilt and has gone down the spiral of becoming, um, yeah, becoming apathetic, demotivated, depressed, and increasing your anxiety levels. These are all kind of things that staying in that place of unhealthy guilt can take you to. And you're experiencing this negative self-talk where I'm not good enough. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to go there. But if it's running through your head, then it, it might be worthwhile getting help. And that too is okay. So if you feel like this is more deep-seated, then you can just kind of figure out on your own just get help. It's okay to do that. It's better for you in the long run if you if you address it properly, fully, completely with some help rather than picking at little pieces and parts of it um, on your own and never actually coming to the root of the problem. Great advice. Thanks, Anne. It's been awesome. It's been great. Have a great day, Vetri Habers. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. For more information about continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepetal.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and of course, thank our sponsors, Companion Animal Health. Companion's products are backed by evidence, supported by education, and successfully implemented through Companion's industry-leading commitment to long-term partnership. You can learn more at companionanimalhealth.com.